Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. What I love most about AA, and before I'm done, you're going to know I love everything about AA, is the simplicity of it. Our co-founder, Dr. Bob, in his last talk in 1950, reminded us of the simplicity of our program. And what he said to us as he left us was this. Let's not louse it up with Freudian complexes and things interesting to the scientific mind that have little to do with our actual AA work. There's a line in the book that bottom lines the simplicity of AA for me, and it's in the chapter Working with Others, and what it says is simply this. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people, it is dependent upon his relationship with God. The single most important fact in my life as I stand here today, and the only reason I'm standing here or anywhere else today, is that I got a power in my life that I choose to call God who does for me one day at a time what I could never do for myself. If I had the power to quit drinking on my own, I'd have never come to AA. Why should I? I establish and grow in that relationship through living, not memorizing, analyzing, or discussing, but through living to the best of my ability, which is never perfect. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous is outlined by the founders in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's the reason that I pray before I introduce me from behind the podium left to my own devices, I would have surely destroyed myself years ago. That prayer reminds me of two things that I believe are vital and crucial to me staying here. First and foremost, the reason that I'm here today is to do God's will, not mine. And it also serves to remind me that he is in charge here this morning. And as always, thank God, I am not. Good morning. My name is Ken. I'm an alcoholic. My parents raised me right. If my mama was here, she'd jump up and say, you ain't turn out right. But that's a different story. No. But I was raised right. And uh, first off, I want to say thank you to the Founders Day Committee for the honor and the privilege of participating. I mean, you know, we get to do a lot of um, really wonderful things in AA. Um, this is an honor and a privilege that is beyond description. And when I can't describe something, I don't bother trying to put words to it. A lot of things that happen in my life today are things of the spirit. And they defy uh, at least the, uh, my vocabulary. So um, I use the two words that my grandmother taught me, um, and that's thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Juanita um, for asking me to do this and for being such a wonderful host this weekend. And I really want to thank Juanita for that wonderful introduction. You know, uh, every time I hear introductions like that in AA, it always reminds me of a story. And it's the story of this man who dies, and at his funeral, you know, his widow and young son are sitting on the front pew listening to the eulogy, and the preacher got up and got to preaching the eulogy, and he talked for 15 minutes about what a wonderful husband this man was. 15 minutes about what a great father this man was. 15 minutes about what an upstanding citizen this man was. Finally, the widow got this real concerned look on her face and leaned over to her son and said, Hey, Junior, go up there and look at that box and see if that's your daddy. <laughs> I think a lot of times uh, uh, these introductions are a little kind, but thank you, Juanita. <laughs> I want to talk for a moment uh, to our new friends, uh, new to Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, yeah. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't come here with AA etiquette. I didn't know what a sponsor was, what a meeting was. I didn't know what a home group was. I didn't know a big book from a Rand McNally Atlas when I came up in here. You know, and I'm very grateful that people didn't assume that. I'm very grateful that people didn't talk down to me when I came here because I didn't know what this was. I'm very grateful for the longtime members of AA who came to podiums like this and shared with me what Alcoholics Anonymous is. And for our new friends here today, See, I'm a real simple guy. I hear best with my eyes. And I'm a street guy, and you stay alive in the street by watching and listening. And so I came to AA, and I started watching and listening. And when I came in here, you know, I saw a couple very distinct groups of people. 
people who were in and out and in and out and not staying sober. And then there was another group of people who were staying sober continuously. So I, I said, well, what is it that's the difference between these two groups, right? The people who seem to stay sober have some things in common, okay? And, and one of the things that the people who stay sober seem to have in common is something called a sponsor. Now, I used to play softball for Cronin's Tavern. They was our sponsor. And uh, they gave us clothes and free beer. And I thought, maybe this AA thing ain't so bad, right? And y'all told me what a sponsor was. You told me that a sponsor is somebody who has working knowledge and experience with the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, who is willing to take me through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous page by page, right, and through this process, and who just as importantly is a living demonstration of those principles in their life who can show me what my life can be like if I do what they do. Notice I said working knowledge and experience, not book knowledge and experience. I knew how to read when I got here. I need somebody to show me how to do this. I have sponsorship and Alcoholics Anonymous today, I'm sponsored by Bob D. in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I have the continued spiritual guidance and support of Ken B. in Cleveland and Bill F. in Lorain, Ohio, and please keep building your prayers. His health is very bad. Um, those are the two men who raised me in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Bill has 50 years, Kenny has 42, Bob has 35. And if you do the math, that's a lot of sobriety that is at my disposal on a daily basis if I choose to use it. Now, if you're new here today, I want to share something with you. Having a sponsor is a great thing. Being sponsorable is a whole lot better. I'm a guy that sponsors intensively in Alcoholics Anonymous. I sponsor guys all over the States, Canada. I sponsor guys in Europe. A guy asked me recently, he said, Ken, how many people do you sponsor? I said, oh, about half of them. Is that not the truth? You no, know, one of the things I've learned, the only value of anything in here, right, is if I put it into practice. Having a sponsor is a great thing. Being sponsorable is even better. There's a lot of people in here today. I like to do this sometime. With everybody that's in this room right now who would be willing to sponsor a new person in Alcoholics Anonymous, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. If you knew, I'd just hook you up. Right? No one ever need leave an AA meeting without the benefit of sponsorship, right? So if you anything like me, when I came here, I had no idea if you had 10 years or 10 minutes, nor did I know whether you'd be willing to help a guy like me who didn't even feel he deserved any help. So the help that you need just identified itself. What you do with that information is up to you. Another thing that the people in, in, uh, that were staying sober seemed to have in common was, was something called a home group, right? And I was one of them newcomers that, you know, I didn't want to get too close to y'all because I was just checking y'all out, right? And they said, if you get a home group, you know, they'll call you if you don't show up and you got a, a commitment. That's why I didn't want all that, right? So uh, finally, uh, a guy said to me one day, Kenny said, if you ain't got a home group, you homeless in AA, and buddy, this is the last place you can afford to be homeless, all right? So I have a home group today. It's the Venice Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Sandusky, Ohio. This is what I tell you about the group that I'm a member of. It ain't the best group in the world. It ain't the worst group in the world. It's just an AA group. Now, one of the things I was taught when I came here is it's okay to stop competing now. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a competition. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. Prior to Alcoholics Anonymous, everything in my life was lived on a better than and less than basis. And a funny thing happens when I live better than or less than, I consciously separate myself from you and I'm on my own again. Anytime I separate myself from you as better than or less than, I'm not a part of. And if I'm not a part of Alcoholics Anonymous, I am in a lot of trouble and my experience abundantly proves that. My group is the best place for me to be, and I hope that your group is the best place for you to be. But I'm not in competition with any, I'm not the best alcoholic to ever come here. I ain't the worst alcoholic to ever come here. The God of my understanding loves you just as much as he loves me, and loves me just as much as he loves you. No, it's a wonderful thing. Tradition one. 
our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. No, so I'm grateful today to be a part of and not a part from. No? And that's what I like to call the total package in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sponsorship, big book and steps, home group, service commitment. In my experience, which is the only thing I'm allowed to share from behind the podium, I have yet to meet an alcoholic of our type. And if you don't know what an alcoholic of our type is, read the book. I have yet to meet an alcoholic of our type who has taken those things, applied them to their life one day at a time to the best of their ability, which is all that's required. If you're new in here, I'm going to take you off the hook. Perfection ain't required here. God only requires of me this day the best that I can do with the tools that he's given me. But if I do that, well, I have yet to see an alcoholic of our type go back out here yet and take a drink. I haven't seen it happen one single time. If you knew here today, the program of recovery was designed for success, not for failure. On the flip side of the coin, however, I have yet to see an alcoholic of our type come in here, ignore those things, and stay sane, sober, or happy for any appreciable length of time. The simplicity of Alcoholics Anonymous. Those who do get and those who don't, don't. And it's just that simple. My first pastor used to say, I never sat in the bar room and watched somebody up at the bar drinking a drink and thought I was going to get drunk watching them drink. That's just as ridiculous as me coming in here, watching you get a sponsor, get in a group, start working the steps and helping others, and think that somehow, magically, it's going to rub off on me. Right? A spiritual awakening as a result of these steps it doesn't say a spiritual awakening as a result of attendance. Right? Attendance, attendance is important. You know, I think this is the best time in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous to be a member of AA. We got more meetings, we got more literature, we got conferences and conventions, we got workshops going all, 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 on all over the place. The dissemination of information in Alcoholics Anonymous is greater now than at any time in our history. However, knowing is not enough. This is a program of action, not a program of knowledge and intellect. Okay? And what I came to understand is all the things that you all were asking me to do, go to lots of meetings, read your big book, work the stuff, all of this. All of these have one purpose. What is that? to facilitate the 12-step process in my life so I can get a relationship with a power greater than myself that can solve my problem. And when I started to understand that, that meetings or knowledge and all of these other things are not a substitute for the spiritual awakening, but all facilitators of it, then AA started to make some sense. Did that make some sense to you? Yeah, it started to make some sense to me then, okay? So, uh, I identified myself as an alcoholic. I got to tell you this. I didn't know what that was when I got here either. I didn't tell y'all I didn't know because I thought I knew everything, right? I always had a definition of an alcoholic, and I like to say it was a sliding definition because as my alcoholism progressed, I kept fitting my definition, right? And so every time I fit it, I would have to change it, right? If you asked me when I was a teenager what an alcoholic was, I said it's somebody that's drunk every day. I don't know where I got that from, but that's what I came up with, right? As a teenager, I became a daily drinker. Er, that ain't it. I said an alcoholic is somebody who misses work, school, or important things in life because of drinking. It interferes with one's priorities in life. That must be an alcoholic. As a teenager... Alcohol began to interfere with work, school, and important things in my life. Er, that ain't it. I finally figured it out. An alcoholic is somebody who goes to jail because of drinking. Certainly, that must be it. As you hear in a few minutes, I really had to change that one. By the time I staggered into the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, my definition of an alcoholic was that guy under the bridge, long trench coat, stocking cap, drinking wild Irish rose, mad dog, a thunderbird out of brown paper slag, and sleeping under a cardboard box. Yes, that certainly must be an alcoholic. And the reason that was my definition, that's the only thing that had not yet happened to me. And if I didn't have a family that I had that insisted for many years on breaking every fall I had, that's exactly where I would have been. 
I drank in Wine O's Alley in Sandusky, Ohio with them old men. The only difference between me and them is when it got dark, there was somebody to open the back door for me and there wasn't anybody left for them. You know? I had the nerve to come into an AA meeting when I was new because I like to compare, not identify when I was new, and poke my chest out in a meeting and say, you know, I ain't never been homeless. There was a man at that meeting who was 52 years sober. And he turned around and looked at me and he said, son, he said, I got some bad news for you. He said, if you grown and you live in your mom and daddy's house and you ain't paying no rent, you homeless. That man hurt my feelings. I hope I didn't step on no toes this morning, but the truth will set you free. So what is this thing called alcoholism? And it took me to the book of Doctor's Opinion. So I suffer from a disease. It's threefold. It's mental, it's physical, and it's spiritual. Mental part of it called a mental obsession to drink. I am a simple guy. What is an obsession, a thought so powerful that it will override or overcome any thinking that I as a human being can raise as a defense against it? What are some of the defenses I tried to raise against taking the first drink? Well, I tried common sense. Did that. That was stupid. That didn't work. My grandmother told me later why that didn't work. She said, boy, you wasn't born with none. But uh, common sense didn't work. I tried uh, fear of consequences I might face if I drank. I'd wake up in the morning in my teens, lay in the bed, and mentally make a list of all the reasons why I ain't going to drink today. Now, if you're doing that, and this if you knew, that's an indicator of a problem. Okay, people who don't have a problem don't do that. But I wake up in the morning, if I drink today, I'm going to get kicked out of school, get kicked off the team, get kicked out of the house, my girlfriend going to leave me, going to get fired from my job, a dirty year, and I'm going to prison. All those things true in my life at one time or another. And if you drink like I drank, you only got three or four of them going on at the same time. So I would lay in the bed, I would take a look at the truth, right? And then I would make a decision based on truth, right? I ain't drinking. I don't want any of those things in my life. And I ain't drinking. And I meant it as much as I mean it now. And then I get out of the bed. And usually about five seconds later, you know, in our book it says that parallel with this sound reasoning will run some insanely trivial excuse to take a drink. And then I get out of the bed, and here's the kind of thought that it comes to me. Maybe you can relate to this. It's Friday. It's Friday, and uh, I've worked all week, which for me is three days, and this ain't my fault anyway, and I deserve a beer. You follow this, right? So I will have a beer. I deserve one. These people can't tell me how to run my life, right? And I pick up a drink and I drink it. And the second part of the disease, Dr. Silkworth called it the phenomenon of craving. A little story I like to tell about that. I'm out cutting my lawnmower on a a grass on a hot day riding on my lawnmower. So is my non-alcoholic next door neighbor. I'm watching him. He get hot and thirsty. He shut his lawnmower off. He walked across the lawn to his deck. He flipped open a cooler. It was full of cold beer. He took a cold one out, he popped the top on her, he sucked her down, it quenched his thirst, and nobody in this arena is going to believe this. But with that full cooler of beer still sitting there, that man actually got back on his lawnmower and finished cutting his grass. I'm over there going, no, dude, you got, really? Right? The difference between me and my neighbor, I keep this simple. I get off of my lawnmower, I pop a top on a cold one, I suck her down. It does not quench my thirst. What it does to me, and maybe to you, is it make me thirstier. There's something physically different about me than nine out of ten people who do. I, when I, my body, they call it a phenomenon of craving. With me, it's an unquenchable thirst. Grass cutting is over at the Coleman house. My lawnmower still be sitting in that same spot in two weeks when I get out the county because that's how I roll. Spiritual malady, soul sickness. I'm a guy that wants to arrange life to suit me. I'm a guy that tries to control the people, places, and things in my life to satisfy my basic God-given needs and desires on my own will. On my own will. 
And as a result of that, as many of you know, and you wouldn't be here today, that don't work. And our book talks about, I'm an extreme example of self-will run riot, though I usually don't think so. And so I'm trying to control and manipulate life to suit me and to meet my needs and satisfy my God-given instincts. And when it doesn't work, some things start to bedevil me. I start to have problems with my personal relationships. I become prey to misery and depression. I can't control my emotional nature. No, I become depressed. I become angry. I become sad. I become restless. I become irritable. And I become discontented. And I found out at the age of 14 that I, I pour alcohol on that. It gives me a sense of ease, comfort, fearlessness, and well-being. And well-being, the effect produced by alcohol doesn't change anything. This temporary... Right? And progressively, that gets worse. Our book says that when the spiritual malady is overcome... We straighten out mentally and physically. Thus, our 12th step says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. See, my problem is not when I'm drinking. When I'm drinking, I get relief. I am a relief-seeking missile, okay? My problem, because when that obsession comes to me, I am as physically sober as I am this morning. My problem is unbearable sobriety. I need to find a way to live where I can have ease and comfort sober. And that's what our program is about. I'm 54 years old. I'm 54 years old. I was born in the city of Sandusky, Ohio, the second of three boys. I was raised in a Christian home. I had a fine mom and dad as ever graced this earth today. I I remember my mom and dad. I'm the son of Pete and Evelyn Coleman. Um, My mother worked for Chrysler Corporation. My father worked for General Motors. I'm retired from Ford. I said we had problems in the house, but we had really nice cars. But anyway... uh, you know, we grew up in the kind of house, you know, we got everything we needed, most of the things that we wanted. If perchance, uh, our grandparents lived with us, if mom and daddy said no, we knew where to go. And that was my grandmother. Because the word no was not in her vocabulary. Um, it, it, Bill in the, in, the, in the 12 and 12 calls our steps a set of principles spiritual in nature. I was introduced to spiritually principled living way before I went off to school. And our house, you know, they told us honesty is the best policy. A real man is always honest with himself and other people. You want an automatic whooping in my house, get caught lying. That happened to anybody else's house in here? That's step one. I learned the importance of the principle of honesty at the end of a history stick. My mother, when I was six or seven years old, called me one day. She said, Kenny, we're concerned about you. She said, contrary to what you believe, the sun does not rise when you wake up and set when you go to bed. She said, look out the window and tell me what you see. Trees, birds, flowers, grass, sky, car. She said, you think this just popped up out of nowhere? There's a power that's greater than you, and all you have to do is be willing to believe that. That's step two. In our house, Mama used to say, if you will make a decision to put your life in the hands of that power that created all this, in my house they call that power God. She said, you will always have what you need no matter what happens outside or around you. My mother was telling me the answer's inside, not outside. Step three. In our house, they told us, anytime you got a problem, no matter how bad you think it is, come talk to us about it. A problem shared is a problem half solved. You're only as sick as your secrets. Mama used to say, no man is an island, right? And I used to say, I'm going to be the first one, right? That's steps four and five, Right? My mother used to say the biggest room in a human being's life is the room for improvement. If you can make C's, you can make B's. If you can make B's, you can make A's. And if you'll ask the power that created all this to help you in any positive endeavor in your life, the power will always help you. That's step six and seven. In our house, they told us anytime you hurt, harm, or wrong someone else, go make right the wrong you've done. You owe time, give it your old apology, you make it your old money, pay it, clean up your mess. That's what responsible people do. Is that not steps eight and nine? 
My mother used to say you can never go forward in this life if you don't know where you are today and what you need to work on to get where you want to go. When I was in high school, I read a book about Socrates, and he said the uninventoried life is a waste. Step 10. Our grandmother said the secret to having a good day is very simple. When you wake up in the morning, slide out of the bed onto your knees, say one word, please. As you go throughout the day and you don't know what to do, ask the power that created all of this to help you. And before you get back in the bed at night, hit your knees again and say two words, thank you, step 11. And in our house, they told us the greatest thing a human being could do with their life was not acquire money and material things. It was to be of service to others. We were taught to follow the golden rule. Talk to folk the way you want to be talked to. Treat folk the way you want to be treated. Respect your elders. And offer to share with those around you what you have before you have your own. Be of service to your fellow man. That is step 12. When I got on the bus to go to kindergarten, I was already armed with a set of principles, spiritual in nature. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, well, Ken, if you had all that before you went to kindergarten, what on earth are you doing leading an AA meeting this morning? I bet you know the answer to that too, don't you? I never did any of it, right? I talked about it a lot. You ever come down to the bar room and be some drunk in there quoting scripture? That was me. Be down to Brown Lee's Tavern. Somebody had a nervous breakdown down Brown Lee's every Friday night. And it was usually because they was going to jail, losing their job, and getting divorced, because that's what we did down to Brown Lee. And Kent would stagger over, somebody sobbing in their beer, and I'd stagger over with a drink in my hand and say something like this Luke chapter 5. Verses 12 to 4. I'm giving spiritual guidance down there, and I didn't just stop there. I give marital advice down to Brownlee. I had never had a wife, but I didn't see how that made a difference. With my life savings laying on the bar, I give financial guidance down to Brownlee. My daddy called me a walking encyclopedia of perfectly useless information. Because none of it was born of my experience. I am a parrot. I go around listening, I read a lot of books, I watch a lot of TV, and I go around trying to sound profound so that you think that I'm something that I'm not. I have to be careful of being a parent in Alcoholics Anonymous, too. A lot of things that I've heard said and repeated in meetings that have nothing to do, actually are contrary to our AA program. I want to share something with you that my sponsor Bill told me when I was new. He said, if it ain't in the book, leave it alone. That's pretty simple. If it ain't in the book, leave it alone. (laughs) I go to meetings at home and I hear people say things like this. Boy, them people out there sure could use what we got in here. Where do you think we got it? It's amazing to me. Spiritually principled living did not originate in Akron in 1935. Those principles are ancient. And there's a ton of people who live like that out there every day. And check this out. They don't expect a pat on the back for it either. i tell you how selfish and self-centered I am. They told me when I was new. Now, we want you to go do something nice for somebody today. And if you tell somebody, it doesn't count. That's how selfish I am. I watched the guy across the street clean the driveway of the elderly people next door. He don't come over to my house and say, hey, did you see me over there? I cleaned up the... Really? Such is the, is the depth of the selfishness and self-centeredness of this alcoholic. Long journey back, ain't it? Long journey back. Um, I was restless here on the discontented as a kid, always felt somehow left. You hear these feelings of inadequacy, these feelings of difference. I was plagued by that as a little kid. I'm a guy that lives inside my head. I don't live in the real world with the rest of you. When the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous said the problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. No, the big book scared me half to death when I first read it. Because I thought, man, whoever wrote this has been following me around. How can somebody, how can y'all know this much about me? No. 
And my problems start up here. You know, and uh, as a kid, uh, I always felt half a step behind everybody else my age. I always felt some, I'm scared of girls. I don't understand a lot of stuff. People seem to have conversations, and I don't I have no idea what they're talking about, you know. And uh, so I started looking outside of me for something to make me feel better. I'm a guy who believes that outside problems, would, if solutions would fix inside problems, and I know today that they won't. No, um, I used to read a lot, daydream a lot, watch a lot of TV. Um, I'm looking for avenues of escape. Now, I don't know that when I'm 9 or 10 years old, but that's what I was doing. My first really drink of choice was my older brother. I had a brother that was four years older than me, and um, I come from a family that play a lot of football. And um, my daddy, he played at West Virginia State. My uncle both played at Penn State. I had a couple cousins that played the National Football League for over 10 years. My family do football. We do it on Saturdays and Sundays. That's what we raised to do. Our baby pictures was not on a bearskin rug. They was in a diaper and a three-point stance in the middle of the living room. That ain't no joke. That's what my daddy was like, right? We were raised and we loved that game. And my brother, by the time he was 16 years old, was six foot two. He weighed 210 pounds. He could run a 4-4-40 on the center track and tennis shoe. Um, nicest guy you ever want to meet um, until he went on to a football field. And uh, he was a pretty nasty guy. And he was a running back. And um, he was going to go to Ohio State. And, um, and I followed my brother everywhere he went. He took me everywhere he went. And I lived in his shadow. And I was perfectly comfortable being Brian's brother. You don't even have to know my name. Right? I am perfectly comfortable. Nobody expects me to be, do, or say anything. And I was very comfortable with that. And, um, and I followed my brother everywhere. September the 5th of 1972, um, my brother suffered a head injury uh, in a scrimmage down in Massillon, in Ohio. We used to scrimmage the Massillon Tigers every year. And um, nine hours of brain surgery on Monday, he died Wednesday, September the 5th, 1972. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, is that what made me alcoholic? Absolutely not. Stop any car out here on the street. Similar people live, people die, tragedies happen. That is right. It was not. Um, what it did to me um, broke my heart. I um, almost killed my mom and daddy. Um, now I ain't going to even tell you what it did to my grandparents. Um, in my darkest days in the street, I have never doubted the power and existence of God. Because I saw God work when that happened. I, I got a real big family. I watched my mother take my entire family, which was about to crumble under this, and put them on her shoulders, and she walked us through that. And I was 13 years old, and I watched that, and I knew that my mama didn't have that kind of power. I've never doubted the power and existence of God. Um, I just felt that it was for people like me that I didn't need it. After my brother's gone, I'm hanging around people my own age. I'm 13 years old. I'm standing on the street corner. Topics of conversation among our crew in 1972 at the age of 13 was very simple. Three things. Drinking beer, smoking weed, and climbing in and out of girls' bedroom windows in the middle of the night. And I was back zero, zero, zero. I had a mother that did not play that. I went to school, church, ball practice at home, right? And I'm standing on the street corner with these guys, and they talking about all this. I got no idea what they're talking about, but I don't let them know that. See, because I'm seeking approval. I was addicted to approval way before I was addicted to alcohol. I hadn't had a drink yet, right? Y'all remember them dogs they used to put in the back window of the car with the head going like this? That was me, right? Yeah, ain't that fun? Yeah, I was over there last night. I'm 13 years old, and I begin to compromise the very values that I'm taught as a child. I become a liar, a fake, and a phony. I'm telling people I've been places I ain't been. I know people I don't know, and that I've done things that I haven't done. And I begin to live a lie. If the 12 steps is an honesty-based program, and it most certainly is, then doesn't it naturally follow that alcoholism is a lie-based disease? And I began to practice dishonesty as a way of life. A manner of living which demands rigorous dishonesty. That's active alcoholism in my life. My mother used to talk to me a lot after my brother died. And my mother would tell me things like, Oh, Kenny, God's been so good to you. One of these days you're going to have a good life and help people and blah, 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 blah. And I used to look at my mom and I'd look at her in the eye and I'd say, I'm going to tell you something. I ain't got no desire to be a service to God, you, or nobody else. If you want to know what I want out of life, I can tell you real quick. I want mine. I want to get it my way. And I'm going to need you to leave me alone while I'm doing it because I'm not going to do it the way you do it. I know that that works for you. God bless you, but I don't need it. 
you know? And my mom would get that sad look on her face and she'd say, you know something? We didn't raise you that way. You don't get it. And I point my finger back at her and I say, no, you the one who don't get it. If you don't think my way going to work, get out the way and watch me roll. That's Ken at age 13. One of the gifts God did give me is I did well in school. I give God credit for that today because I'm a guy that didn't really have to work for it. That's a gift. That's not something that I earned. It's not something that I worked for. And um, I was a straight-A student. Um, my first sponsor, Bill, told me when I was new, anytime I'm in a room alone, all my enemies are there. And what he was referred to as my faker. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm 13, 14 years old. I'm sitting in study hall in, in Sandusky High School, and I had a visit from the enemy, my thinking. Now, here's a thought that occurred to me that day. You know, these people are here breaking their neck trying to get B's and C's taking general math and science. I'm taking calculus, physics, fourth year Latin, fourth year English. I'm sleeping through class and getting straight A's. You know, it just might be entirely possible that I know everything. I had no evidence to support that thought as being true. I accepted it as a fact because that's what I do with my thinking, and I left the room and took action on it. I actually went home and told that to my mother and father. I thought they ought to know because it would change things around the house a little bit, you know. And uh, what happened when I did that, my father came up off that couch like his behind was off. I was scared of my daddy. My daddy played football when they had face masks. And, uh, <laughs> my daddy was a big guy, and uh, I did not wait to see what he wanted. Uh, I never asked him to the day he died. He must have been thinking, look what we got in the house. I'm going to kill it. I, I don't know. You know. But I broke for the screen door. I got out the screen door and I closed it and he was right behind me. And I turned around and looked at him and he looked at me and said, boy, so I'm going to tell you something. You have a hard life. He said, well, Kenny, don't nobody know everything. And I stood there and I looked him in his eye and I laughed in his face. That was a significant day in my life because on that day the door closed. Our book says honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness are the three essentials of recovery. Right? And they are indispensable. On that day, I closed my mind. A closed mind cannot learn. Right? And uh, from that day forward, everybody in my life was an idiot. My mother, my father, the preacher, the teacher. Later on, the police, the judges, the lawyer, the probation, the PO. You can't tell me because I already know it. And if I don't know it, it ain't worth knowing. It became my philosophy of life. Selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, self-absorbed, afraid of my own shadow. Hmm? And according to my mother, mean as a rattlesnake, and I have yet to take a drink of alcohol. I tell people I was the perfectly tilled soil for the disease of alcoholism. All I had to do was water it and see if I had the allergy, and one day I did. I got in the car with a guy I played basketball with in high school who had the life I lived in my head. I don't live in the real world with the rest of you. Johnny had a snazzy car pocket full of money, ran around with the kind of girls I ran away from. And I got in the car with Johnny, and Johnny said, hey, Coleman, you want to get something to drink? Now, I had been warned about drinking. Alcoholism does not run in my family. It gallops. And I have been told we do not do alcohol well. Both sides of my family are rife with the disease of alcoholism. But if Johnny had said to me that day, let's go rob the carry out, I guarantee you I would have done so. That's a little sense of self that I have. That's how, the links I'm willing to go to to find an outside solution to this inside problem. We went to the drive through We bought 10 quarts of Swiss Mall liquor bowl. We dropped the convertible top on that beautiful Pontiac. Johnny looked at me and said, five quarts to you, five quarts to me. He cranked up the music. We rolled through the streets of Sandusky, and we drank that beer, and my life changed. I've heard a lot of descriptions of people on that first drunk and the effect produced by alcohol. What I can tell you on that day is pretty simple. On that day, I started drinking. I started growing, and the rest of the world started shrinking. I went from shy, insecure, and afraid to bold, confident, suave, debonair, and absolutely fearless in about 20 minutes. We went behind the Derrick apartments where all the thugs hung out. I had not said five words in public in the last three years. I looked at Johnny. People surrounded the car. I said, turn that music down. There's a few things I want to tell a few people who are present here this afternoon that I've been wanting to tell them for quite some time. And I went around that circle of hoodlums and told each and every one of them not only what I thought of them, but also what they needed to do, in my opinion, to improve themselves. The reaction of the guys around that car, guys was leaning in the car and hugging me, saying, see, I told you, I told you, Coleman, all right, he's loose enough, he's doing a little drinking, he's one of us. Chuck Chamberlain, 
said that there is one problem in which is encompass all problems, and that is conscious separation from God and our fellow man. And there is one solution in which is encompass all solutions, and that is conscious contact with God and our fellow man. Now, I didn't get conscious contact with God that day, but I got conscious contact with my fellow man. And um, I connected a dot that day. That when I drink, I change. And I now have the acceptance of the people whose acceptance I want the most. And that wasn't mom and dad. That was in drive-by shooters behind the Derrick apartment. Alcohol equals success, and you better believe I got it. We left from there. We went over to the home of some of them girls you run around with, I run away from. I had never been there in my life. I walked into that home like I was paying the mortgage. I went over and sat down at the dining room table and I made eye contact with the finest girl to graduate from Sandusky High School in his 172 year history. I had never even breathed in her direction, much less said hello. And I looked over there at her and she looked up at me and I said, come here. And she got up and started walking toward me. Any sane human being at this point would probably think, hey, kid, if you weren't so shy and scared, look what you're going to do just by speaking up. Is that what I thought? Absolutely not. Here's what I thought. Maybe you can relate to this. If you had been drinking before now, look what you could have done. Dude, look what you've been missing. I can remember that thought today as clearly as dead, right? This is an honest program, however, not to be honest with you. When she got over there to me, I had no idea what to do with her. I don't think that far ahead when I'm drinking. So I, I watch a lot of TV, though, because I got a lot of time on my hands. And on TV, they go like this. So I did, and she sat down in my lap. And my life changed again. <laughs> and the upshoot to the whole thing is this, on that day. For the first time in my life, I felt whole. And that's a very powerful thing. What happened the rest of that day, give you the rest of my drinking history, I drink trouble. I'm a trouble guy. Um, one of the things that I don't do is stand behind the podium and glorify the disease that burned my life to the ground and destroyed my family. I don't glorify, I don't stand behind a podium and talk about the good times I had drinking. You want to know Kent's definition of a good time drinking? Any consequences that have to be paid as a result of my drinking are paid by somebody else. How many sleepless nights did I visit upon my family? In, my, in our house, before I started drinking, there was no screaming and hollering. Before I started drinking, there was no sleepless nights. There was no anxiety. There was no tension. There was no resentment. There was no guilt. I bought that into my parents' house, and I infected them with it till they were sicker than I was. Thank God for the fellowship of al -Anon. So I can tell you the truth, drink trouble right from the very start. If if this was a drink, and I stood here today and took a drink, a cop would drop right out of that light and land in the middle of this floor. <laughs> what happened that day? Got drunk, went in the blackout, I have no idea what went on the next four or five hours. According to eyewitnesses at the house, I came in and threw up a trail through the house, through the living room, through the kitchen, through the family room. My grandfather fell on the floor laughing. I went in the bathroom, hit everything but the toilet. The next thing I remember is my mother knocking on the bedroom door, screaming at me, come out here, clean up this mess, you know you've been drinking, blah, 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 blah. I staggered into the hallway and what later years would be my drinking uniform, my underwear. I'm bouncing off of them hallway walls. I got a hangover, that's a lot. I'm dying. I go in the bathroom, lock the door. She's still screaming in the hallway. I put my hands on the bathroom sink. I look through bloodshot eyes in the mirror, and this is what I said. Man, oh, man, I can't wait to do that again. Grounded for life is what was being discussed in the living room, right, and how that sentence was going to be carried out. So immediately I drink, 
and I'm suffering negative consequences as a result of my drinking. So I'm in the bathroom, and I have a meeting with myself. I love to have a meeting with myself because I don't recommend it. Uh, because I seem to be able to solve most anything that's going on. And I had a meeting with myself. And I said, okay, Ken, let's take a look at what happened. You got drunk, yep. You got sick, yep. You got grounded for life. Yes, this is all true. Now, Ken, the reason you got grounded for life is not because you got drunk. The reason you got grounded for life is because you got sick. What you need to do, young man, is learn how to drink without getting sick. Is anybody following this? Not drinking was never on the table. Why? Because the effect produced by alcohol. I had a sense of wholeness, fearlessness, and well-being. I had fellowship with my peers and contemporaries. Alcohol equals success, baby. And I was gone. And I never looked back until 18 years later I came to you. I, I'm going to get through this thing real quick. I just want to tell you, I am a parent abuser. They talk about child abusers in society today. I'm 16 years old. I got a car and a 1 o'clock curfew. I went to the city of Toledo, Ohio. And this is Toledo. My family from Toledo is in here this morning. But they used to have a place out on Dora Street called the All Beautiful Shade Nightclub. At least that's what they said on the radio. Oh, when I got to the Shade Nightclub with my fake ID and three-piece suit at the age of 16, it was a hole in the wall, but here regardless. I'm in the Shade Nightclub drinking a gin and juice and dancing with a woman older than my mother. And uh, I come home at 4.30 in the morning. Now, my curfew is 1 o'clock. My mother was always up when I came home. Anybody else's mother up when you come home? That bedroom light always on? I come in that front door and she holler out the bedroom, Kenny, come here. I want to see you. And I would stick my head around the corner of my mother's bedroom door. My daddy be asleep. And, and, and I would look at my mother and I would say, why are you up? If y'all go somewhere, I don't sit up here at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning waiting on y'all to come home. The, my point to you is this. I'm so full of me, I can't even see you. The world is not full of people. Y'all like cardboard cutouts to a guy like me. I can't even comprehend the love of a parent or a child. It don't even register with me. The only thing I'm concerned with is Kent. And uh, and that's what I said to my mom. You know, and I come home at 4.30 this one night, and she's sitting on the couch. She ain't in the bedroom. And I walked in the door, and she had tears running down her face. And this is what my mama told me. She said, Kenny, she said, as your parents, we owe your roof over your head, food to eat, clothes on your back, and an education. And we have fulfilled our part of the bargain. She said, but buddy, I got something you can't have, and that's my peace of mind. She said, Kenny, you're going to penitentiary or the cemetery, and I got a message for you. I ain't going with you. I'm done. I'm giving you to God. I'm done. Go. Do what you want. I'm done. And this is what I said to my mom. I broke you. I broke you. And I want you to understand something, mama. I'm a little bit disappointed. You're such a spiritual giant. Because it wasn't even that hard. And I walked away and I left my mother sitting there. That's Ken at age 16. Went off to college, was drunk for five years, broke every rule that they had in, in place at that university. And by the time I left there, there was some new rules in place as a result of me having been there. That's not a joke, and I ain't proud of it. Um, I'm still making amends to that institution to this day, and I'm very grateful that they're giving me the opportunity to do so. I was an absolute animal. By this time, by the time I'm 19 years old, I got shakes in the morning. I'm 19 years old. I went to see Tom the bartender at the Boar's Head Inn. That's where I had set up headquarters. And uh, Tom was kind of like my sponsor, I guess. I told Tom, I think I got Parkinson's. I thought I couldn't fasten my shirt. He said, you're 19 years old. Yeah, Parkinson's. He said, I'll tell you what you do. He said, go get a fifth of 100 proof old granddad, drink two shots in the morning. I guarantee your hands will stop shaking. I got the granddad. I got up the next day shaking like a leaf. I drank two shots. My hands stopped shaking. You know what I said? That man's a genius. My first sponsor, Bill, pointed out to me, he said, you noticed you never questioned the bartender. You were surrounded by family, friends, coaches, cause all these people who love you, and all you can say to them is, I'm grown and I ain't hurting nobody. But you never questioned the bartender to our new friends here today. Why is it that I'm always willing to listen to the people who harm me? Why is that? I got out of school and I went to work in a factory. Now, you don't need a college degree to do that. But you have to understand, as my alcoholism progressed, 
I went from having goals and dreams and hopes of being a successful businessman to alcoholism went to the center of my life, and I constructed my life to accommodate my alcoholism. Read Bill's story. Watch the compromises that he continues to make. I drop out of school. I go do this. I go do this. The same thing happened to me. Bill's story is Kent's story. And, and I'm going to work in a factory because they got something I needed there. It's called a union. And if you don't go to work the way I don't go to work, you need a union. I get out of the drinking thing now. Um, I was convicted of driving under the influence of alcohol seven times in the state of Ohio. I've been arrested on felony wealth charge. I was banned for life from Lucas County um, as a result of some things I did there. Um, on and on and on. I mean, cut, had a heart attack at the age of 28 and dropped dead in my bedroom. Um, took me to the hospital, put me in the cardiac unit. Um, 48 hours later, my heartbeat was stable. They put me in a regular room. When I was in the cardiac unit, I said a prayer. God, if you let me live, I'd never do this again. And I meant it as much as I mean it today. Two hours in the regular room, and uh, I'm drinking. Two hours out of the cardiac unit. If I had the power to quit drinking on my own, I'd never come to AA. Why should I? No matter how great the necessity or the wish, I ain't got the power. They cut me out of a car. Um, corner of Columbus Avenue and Taylor Street, 9.30 on a Sunday morning. Um, God, I never drank again. Uh, and I went to court drunk for that offense. The kind of mind I got, I was sentenced to five years in the state penitentiary at Mansfield. And I stood in front of a judge and said, before I throw you away, I'm going to give you one more chance. He said, I'm going to place you on a period of indefinite probation. You will come down here, you will report on Friday. If you take a year analysis and so much as an after shows up, I'm going to send you to prison for five years. Thank you, God. I know I got the break of my life. I'll never drink again. I left work that Friday morning to go report to adult probation for the first time. As I'm driving across town, here's the thought that came to me. You know they say they never test you on your first time reporting. They don't think anybody's that stupid. Really? Can anybody relate to that? And who is they? I stopped off the Super Bowl Tavern, got a doubleheader and granddad, and staggered into adult probation with five years of, of, of in prison hanging over my head. And I didn't do that because I'd rather be drunk than sober. I didn't do that because I'd rather be incarcerated than free. I did that because I'm powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. At the end of my drinking, no baths, no showers. I got a liver that's distended about seven inches. Every time I take a drink of whiskey, I go in the bathroom and I cough up all this white stuff. I found out later when I got in the hospital that my body would no longer metabolize alcohol. I was drinking. What I was actually coughing up was pure alcohol. My body is now rejecting what my mind is obsessed with. I'm 32 years old and I'm dying of alcoholism. How dark it is before the dawn. My last three years, I tried everything I could think of on my own to stop drinking. I changed shifts at work. I quit hanging around them guys. I got the booze out of the house. I gave my paycheck to people. Hold it. Don't give it to me no matter what I say. Anybody in here? I did everything. I went back to church. I hold the record for reinstatement at Ebenezer Baptist Church. They knew when I was coming, they read the newspaper. Oh, we'll see Kenny Sunday, right? But nothing changes if nothing changes. And uh, I gave up. My last year of drinking was just a drinking for oblivion that they talk about in the big book. Um, alcoholism took me to a place and I never want to forget it. Um, it was a place of cold blooded, cold hearted indifference. I just stopped caring about me, you, and anything else. The three most prominent words in my vocabulary was I don't care. In my world, there was no day or night, no right, no wrong, no good, no evil, no God, no devil. I just simply do not care. I believe that's as far away from God as a human being can get, and I never want to forget that that's where I came to you from. came out of a bar called the Pump Lounge. It was a night like any other night. Everything in my life is burned to the ground. I got in the car. I'm supposed to be where my brother was driving. I'm supposed to be to work at midnight. If I'm one minute late, I'm fired. And um, got the same clothes on. I no longer bathe or shower. Um, 
And I had what they call a moment of clarity or a moment of sanity. The guy in Cleveland, six pack Charlie, he said, That's the moment when God paralyzes the liar in you long enough for you to see the truth. And for the first time in almost 20 years, my head cleared. And what I saw very clearly was this. If you don't stop drinking, you're going to die. And you better get some help because you can't do it by yourself. And you better do it now because you're running out of time. I didn't know where. And I went and I called the guy that I went to college with, who was my best friend and drinking buddy, um, who's a doctor today. And I didn't know who else to call. I owed him $5,000, hadn't paid him a dime, didn't even know if he'd take a call from me. And I called his house, and his wife answered the phone, and this is what she said and how she said, Richard is kin. And Rich got on the phone, and this is what I said to him. Rich, this your boy, man, I need some help. And this is what he said to me. He said, man, I've been waiting for this call for seven or eight years. Hack a bag, stay by the phone, I got you. And he is not a member of this fellowship. When I get a call at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know what I tell the guy on the other end, don't you? Pack a bag, stay by the phone, I got you. And for that, I am responsible. He told me to come down there. He lived in Centerville outside of Dayton. He's going to put me in a place in Xenia called Green Hall, one of them big hospital treatment centers they used to have. I got one of them $25,000 big book. And uh, next day, my brother and his wife in the front seat. I'm in the back seat. I had a case of Genesee beer. Now, I didn't know too much about this treatment thing, but I kind of figured out my own. They wasn't serving no liquor in there. And uh, so I got to drinking on the way down there. And I got three or four of them cold beers in me. And y'all know something? I had a visit from the enemy on my way to treatment because of the effect produced by alcohol. Here's the thought that occurred to me on my way to treatment after a couple cold beers. You know, I just may have overreacted here. It ain't that bad. Really? So I told my brother and him, I said, well, I think we're making a mistake here. What I didn't know is my daddy told my brother and his wife, I'll give you $100, you're going to bring that tramp back here. That's a true story. True story. And my brother wanted that hundred, so they kept going. He carried me down to Richard's house, and Richard put me in his car, and he drove me, bought me a quarter miller for the trip from his house over to Xenia. And we pulled in the parking lot of Green Memorial Hospital. I had about this much left in that quarter. He put that car in park. He turned, he looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, go ahead, dog, finish that. And he said, don't ask me how I know this, man. He said, that's the last drink you're ever going to take. That was the 17th of May. 1992, and I have not had another drop of alcohol or anything stronger than I asked for since that day. I want to share something with you. Left to my own devices, I would have surely destroyed myself years ago. That was for you and for God, because that's how this thing works. We stay sober together by the grace of God. And I have to tell you, where I live at, they'll come in the meeting, and they'll say, because if you knew here, Relapse is not a requirement for recovery. Right? However, I don't think most people are relapsing. They come to our group, they say, stand up and say, oh, I'm reintroduce myself. I have relapsed. I, John, my name is John Doe. I said, John, can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure, Kent. I said, John, do you have a sponsor? Well, no, no. Yeah, have you read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and applied the steps to your life a day at a time to the best of your ability? Well, no. No. John, do you have a home group and a commitment? Well, no. No. Well, John, what did you relapse from? A relapse. Relapse is a return to a prior condition or state. If the prior condition is untreated alcoholism and you haven't treated it, you have not relapsed. You continue to drink. So we need to stop letting people go around saying, hey, hey don't work. I tried it. No, you didn't. You, why don't you tell the truth? I went to some meetings. I didn't do what they say, and I drank again. I did great at treatment. I got out of detox. They had guys reading stories of their drinking escapades. 
counselor said to me, Kent, tell us what you think about what you heard. I said, well, I'm down here for a few days to get help with this small problem I might have. I'd like to volunteer to help you with these people. But these are the sickest people I've ever seen in my life. That one statement got me an extra week of treatment. I spent 35 days in the 28-day program. The next morning, my enemy married a nurse who was 28 years sober, hung a sign around my neck this big. and said, I am not a counselor. I had to wear it for a whole week. Next day, they had me write and read to the group. I did. Jim said, put your chair in the middle of the room and let's tell Kent what we think of him. He said, I'm going to start the ball rolling by saying Kent's so full of BS, his eyes are turning brown. If you threw him in water, he'd fall away. And that was the nicest thing that was said in that room that day. And what them guys told me was simply this. If I didn't get honest with myself, I was going to leave that place and I was going to die. My sponsor, Kenny, says in how it works, says a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. That is not a suggestion. That is not a suggestion. And I went back to my room and I sat on the bed and I, and I made a decision to be as honest as I could the rest of the time. See, game recognized game. Whatever bit them guys bit me, and I knew it, because you can't fabricate the stuff that we do. When I hear somebody, man, we just we make we do stuff. Stephen King can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I went to my first AA meeting, and it was a discussion meeting there at Green Hall. And it was a lady from Indiana. She raised her hand. She had a problem. She shared it. They went around the room and without judgment or condemnation, shared with that lady similar problems they had had and the solutions they had found. I saw the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous come to the aid of a complete and total stranger at my first meeting. And, and my only thought at that was, how could something like this exist and I've never heard of it? I was attracted to the fellowship of AA at my very first meeting. Didn't understand it, didn't know what it was, but I knew I wanted to come. I got out of treatment after 35 days. They told me, get a sponsor in a home group. I said, I don't need all that because you have to remember I know everything. And I came home and I started to play a game. It's called don't drink, go to meetings, and don't do nothing else. If I put my arm through a window and I cut an artery in my arm, I start to bleed out. I put a towel on my arm. I drive myself to the hospital. I run in the emergency room and sit down. I'm bleeding all over the floor. The doctor comes out and says, come on back here, Mr. Coleman. We'll treat you now. I sit there in the emergency room, bleeding to death. Look at the doctor and say, no, thank you. I'll just sit here. And I bleed to death in the emergency room. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the emergency room. I've been here long enough now that I've watched people who attend these meetings on a daily basis die of untreated alcoholism before my very eyes. The treatment for the disease I suffer from is a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, period. Period. And we get that how? Meetings, sponsorship, and service. I went to over 250 meetings in three months and ended up in the parking lot of Daly's Pub. Because nothing changes if nothing changes. I was sicker than I was, and now I don't have any relief. And I sat in that parking lot, and I said my first prayer in AA, God, what am I doing wrong? Like a lightning bolt, what are you doing right? If you go to that many meetings, you hear it every day. Get a sponsor, work the steps, read the book, help others, get home. I ain't do none of that. I pulled out of the parking lot of Daly's Pub, and I went to an AA meeting, and I ran to a man. And I said, would you help me? And this is what the man told me. He said, I will sponsor you out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and show you how I live these steps in my life one day at a time. I got, I, I, they, they call the steps a kid of spiritual tool. I got a toolbox in my house. I ain't never seen a hammer and screwdriver walk across the floor of my house and fix the thing. The only value of a tool is if I pick it up and use it, the only value of the steps is if I apply them to my life. I've stood behind podiums of AA all over the world at this point in my life. I have yet to attend a meeting where somebody stands up and says, works if you know it. And my sponsor took me through the steps that I try to live them today. As I wrap this up, um, I just want to say I had a chance to make amends to my mom before she died. My mother had bone cancer. I moved back into that house to help my dad take care of my mom. And for almost two years, my sponsor told me, don't you say nothing. He said, for once in your life, go do what you've never done. And that's going to that home and be the kind of son 
that God put you on this earth to do. And that's what I did. And uh, my mom saw me go to all those AA meetings. My mother saw me bring my first five seeds into the house and sit down at the kitchen table and open the big book of alcoholics and now my mama saw me put on a shirt and a thigh and go lead AA meetings when I didn't have a suit. And um got close to the end. My sponsor said it's time. And uh, I had a big speech planned out. They got her off the morphine. I went to the hospital. I sat down. My mother had the biggest brown eyes I've ever seen. And I looked at my mom, and my mom looked at me. And um, the only thing that I could say was, Mama, I'm sorry. Something I've said a million times. But action speaks louder than words. And this time, it meant something different. And she's what she told me. She said, Kenny, I forgive you. She said, I want you to promise me that you'll stay with those people in AA. They were able to do for you what we could not. And I told her that I would, and I have. My mom died holding my hands and looking in my eyes with all my family up in the room calling her name. And my uncle stood in the back of the room and said, don't call her name no more. So she ain't going to look away from him. That's how she wants to go. And that's how my mama left this earth. And I've been blessed a million times over, but if I never got nothing else, I want you to know that was enough. Thank God for the fellowship and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. My dad died. I was 18 years sober, and he and I had a great time. No judgment, no condemnation. No, I, I made amends to my dad. He did things I didn't really agree with after my mother died. None of my business. I didn't spoil the amends by trying to exert my will like I could tell somebody else what they need to be doing. And I'm grateful that I listened to y'all. And um, I was the last person to be with my dad before he died. My dad saw the birth of my children. I got married when I was about three years sober. And uh, he had a real special deal with my little girls. I got two little girls, and they'd go to my father's house, and they'd trash his house in five minutes. And he called me on the cell phone and said, come back here and get these kids. And i go back to get them. And I told my dad, I said, I'm sorry. I said, I don't know what's wrong with him. He said, I'll do that. Yours. Get them out of here. You know? And they had a real special deal. And, uh, and my dad was a great guy. And, and uh, got divorced. I was 20 years sober. And I was surrounded by the love of alcoholics and all. See, my family is in here. They walked me through that um, when I thought my life was over. And um, my life is only beginning. My life ain't over. You know, um, what I know is this. God's grace is sufficient to meet any need that I've had. Any need that I've had. Lived in Vegas for a while. I'm back in Ohio now. Um, my oldest daughter graduated from high school last week. Um... If you knew here, I want to share something with you before I go. They gave me a tape of a man named Warren Chisholm Sr., 12th man in AA in Cleveland. And in that tape, Warren Chisholm Sr. made this statement that anyone who comes here who is willing to practice the principles and precepts of this program as outlined by the founders in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous need never drink again one day at a time. I ran to my sponsor because he was a friend of Bill. And I said, Bill, he can't say that. And Bill said, yes, he can, Kent. And he said, I'm going to tell you why. He said, because this is a spiritual program and God doesn't fail. There is no failure here. If this does not work for me, it's because I have not fulfilled the conditions that have been laid down. I have to participate in my own recovery. God doesn't fail. Those who do get and those who don't, don't. And it's just that simple. If I said anything that helped anybody today, thank God, don't thank me. And if I didn't say nothing to help you today, guess what? You could come here, Katie, this afternoon, right? God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. God could and would if he were sought. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you. Until then, bye.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.